Welcome again to our series on resilience during the time of COVID-19. We're thrilled to have you with us today. We welcome back our Rita Brock and, Sin and Cinda Rushton to join us again. And today we're going to be focusing on the nursing t experience during COVID-19. And gosh, how appropriate during this week when we're recognizing nurses. And I, I was thinking about this driving over for our meeting today. I dare to say that I can't imagine any nurse who would have thought that they would be where they are today, giving of themselves and sacrificing themselves and, and issues around family to be with us. And so we thank them so much for joining us today. Volunteers of America is proud to be hosting this series, our second in a series of at least four, perhaps more, you'll hear more about it later. But for the past 124 years, Volunteers of America, VOA, has been on the cutting edge trying to meet people where they are in the most challenging times of life. So we're thrilled to have you all with us today. And it's a huge lineup and we have a lot going on. But before we do, we want to begin with a centering, a bit of an in, in, um, invocation by um, Tanya Jackson, who you'll hear more from in a little bit, our Vice President of Housing and Health Initiatives. Tana, Tanya, begin our session with us today with an invocation, please. Thank you so much. Lord, guide me through my day. And when all seems to go astray, during this time of crisis, you can sing so far away. Help me to know that you are near, to hold me close as I shed my tear. Grant me to a grant to me a deep peace and allow my strength to increase. Use my hands to bring a touch of love and lead my feet to help all I meet. Use my voice to give a word that is soothing to one of the hurting world. And when the day is done, remind me to recall that you are the one who helps us all. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tanya. We're going to have a panel of folks working in the nursing field today. Tanya is going to lead the panel and we have another a group of uh, four folks with us. And so I'm going to read, because there's just an incredible gifted crew, I'm going to read some bios. So if you'll just be patient with me because I re we really want you to know who it is that's with us today and the contributions that they're making during the COVID-19 virus. So Tanya Jackson is the Vice President of Housing and Health Initiatives for Volunteers of America National Service. In this role, she provides direction for the intersection of affordable housing and health care. She is a highly accomplished nursing leader with vast experience in health leadership, health integration and coordination of care, governmental services, quality management and service excellence. Tanya earned her master's in healthcare administration from Central Michigan University and a bachelor of science degree in nursing from Winston-Salem University. We also have with us Rhonda Jones. R Rhonda will be sharing with us by video and she currently has a master's degree in science of nursing and work at Laurel Manor Care Center of Volunteers of America as director of nursing. She has worked in healthcare since 1988 on this journey, she writes, I have experienced working in ICU, ER, med surge, psych, geriatric care, and as a nursing instructor. This experience provided me with the opportunity to enhance previous skills and gain new knowledge. As my education expanded, my career path included staff nurse, charge nurse, staff development coordinator, nursing instructor, and director of nursing. Also with us today is Virginia Scott. She is a director of nursing for the City of Cincinnati Department of Health. In this role, she provides nurse leadership for all the nursing services administered by the Department of Health, as well as quality and compliance. Virginia is a demonstrated nursing leader in population health, value-based services, and transformational behavioral change and compliance. 
Virginia has a master's of science from Walden University, a bachelor degree in health administration from Wilberforce University, and an RN degree from Wright State University. And Donna Webb. Donna is Chief Operating Officer of Pathways Health Services in Lake Elmo. With over 30 years of leadership and consulting experience in post-acute care, Donna's experience includes over 20 years of consulting on a national level to Volunteers America, assisting with the clinical direction and is currently the Interim Vice President of Clinical Services. Donna is the Chief Operating Officer of Pathway Health Services with over 30 years experience. We welcome all of our panelists with us today. Tanya, we pass it back to you. Uh, Tanya will begin the session with us. There'll be a video that our own Sam McAllister will help us with. Sam keeps all the technical stuff going. So we toss it to Tanya and she will carry on with the questions and interaction with, with the panel. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you so much. Again, you heard our great esteemed panel of four nurses that will be presenting today. And we're going to have three questions that we're going to ask our nurses. And this is going to be a frank discussion. These are our frontline staff if they're on the job. And so um, let's start off with the questions that we will be asking. So the first question today is we all know that nurses make up the bulk of healthcare workforce and are natural problem solvers and innovators. Nurses are experiencing pressure, fear, exhaustion, fatigue, and ongoing stress. This ongoing stress and trauma has an impact on the frontline nurses' mental health, their safety, and their ability to provide the best possible care. As a frontline nurse, given these current situations, our, um, our nurses today, they're gonna explain how they are managing their stress. They're also gonna explain what they're doing for self-care, and they're gonna provide some advice for the frontline nurses out there. The second question that we will be discussing today is I recently read an article by our esteemed guest panelists today that will come on later today, uh, Cinda. And um, she was speaking, um, she will be speaking later again, like I said, in this webinar. But this article truly focused on the conditions and the decisions encountered daily by nurses um, during this massive healthcare challenge. Um, but our nurses, they're going to talk about the challenges that they are experiencing, experiencing, and they will also share with you some of the experiences that they are going through. The third question that our panel will be addressing today is, um, I belong to several listservs and they have group, group discussion sites. So more so now in the midst of COVID-19, one of the discussions that I read the other day is centered around COVID-19 and moral injury on the front line. And this particular discussion really centered around vulnerability. It's centered around vulnerability being a strength. And it also centered around if you need help, ask for it. So one of the nurses that was on the group, um, the group that I belong, this particular group that I belong to, she started, she was discussing how she's having issues around her normal daily routine, how this is truly impacting, impacting her life. How this is her new norm. Um, when she goes home in the afternoon, she has to bag up her uniform before entering her house. How when she looks in the mirror, she sees the invitations from her long day of wearing her facial mask. Um, and, and she just talked about the emotions that she's going through, how vulnerable she's feeling. Another nurse, she was a, she's a Gulf War nurse. And she spoke about when she enters her hospital every day, she is seeing the tent lined up and this reminds her of when she was in the war and how she's being conflicted by some of the you know her feelings from being in the gulf war to now having to experience this pandemic on her home front again the nurses they're going to share their stories and they're going to give advice to that vulnerable frontline personnel 
we're going to start this discussion off with mom with um Virginia Scott. Hello, everyone. Hi, Virginia. So, do you want me to just jump right in? Tanya? Yes, we would like for you to just jump right in and answer the three questions. Okay. So, when we think about self-care and what are we doing and how are my teens feeling, I first had to self-assess. I believe that when we self-assess, you know exactly what is the tone of my voice and how are my actions, because as of right now, I have 120 medical staff that's on front lines for the city of Cincinnati. So when I speak, my team needs to listen, and they need to mostly be aware that I'm calm. How, how, how am I giving directions, and what, what, is, what is my presentation um, like? Um, because we all know that this was an unknown state, and the, first, the number one for me is, Jenny, self-assess for your team that you're leading was first reaction. Um, I needed to be fully aware how my staff felt to maintain a sense of hope for them because I received several phone calls. What is this going to mean? What do I do? I have a husband that's sick. I, I, can't, I can't go touch a patient. And these are nurses that work every day with the sick population, especially in public health. So I maintain self-assessment, and I turned that into a daily huddle with my team. That daily huddle allowed them to be able to express their concerns. Where am I at? How are you feeling? And then when I talk to my nurse managers, I ask them, lean in with your team. Lean in and ask, how are your children doing? I'm staying at home. Are you okay? Your husband, you find out a lot of times when you lean in with your staff, my husband is not working. We don't have any food. So it was really that human, that human piece. Because as nurses, we learn to just jump in and act. And a lot of times with our staff and our nurses, we just jump in. We go, go, go. And I had my managers pull back, ask them how they're doing. Pay attention. Use those assessment skills when you're starting to see that someone is withdrawn and they're not really talking like they used to. And see how they're really doing because it was a lot of stress during this time. And it was, it was so much unknown and the, the, the policies was changing, the symptoms was changing. And now we're hearing asymptomatic and then um, – you know, I'm hearing a lot of my staff stating that now they're the breadwinner and they never had to be. So for me, um, it was really to self-assess, to maintain what I needed for them. Then what I told my staff, I had to share a little bit. As Tanya, you spoke about prayer every day on my desk over here. I read daily devotions, and I pull something out of it, and I ask the Lord to tell me, show me, take the blinders off so I can ensure that I am delivering the right message for my team. Um, and then for myself, and I even shared with the team one day, I said, I take a bubble bath every day. And they just laugh. They you think of every day I'm going to take my bubble bath and I'm going to pray. And I said, do whatever that is for you. Whatever that reflection is for you, whatever that peace is for you, when you step out of bed, just plant your feet and um, take that peace and reflect. So that is one piece that I did for self-care. And then our second question we actually talked about, I think it was challenges. So what challenges did I face? And we did hear what Tanya stated about all the challenges that a lot of the hospital systems are, are going through, the nurses. I'm hearing a lot of PPE. I don't have masks. I don't have the proper masks. Well, within public health, I didn't, per se, my team didn't run into that because we did have the PPE and I did have the resources and I did have the city behind me. I did have the health commissioner and assistant health commissioner behind me. And they knew I have the bulk of the clinical team right now. So whatever I needed, they were right there. If I pick up the phone right now, whether it's 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, because I am on call for the city, um, I can reach out to one of them and they were right there. So I didn't really have those challenges, but I will say that my challenges, my, over, my overall challenge has been policy change. As you know, working in government and everything was changing guidance from CDC and Ohio Department of Health was changing so rapidly that I had to change and be on top of that for my team to ensure that they had um, the latest information. So that was the biggest um, challenge for me. And it was a blessing um, because a lot of uh, other healthcare care um, 
um, clinicians, they didn't have that. So it was something that when I was watching that they didn't have the PPE that they needed and things like that. And when we go on to the third question and we actually talk about um, what can I share in my story and, and, and everything, I will still say to push pause. Uh, for my leaders out there, that if you are leading teams and you are leading um, this way, I would say just continue to stay centered because when I found out that this was happening, it was early March, I heard um, the governor state that he was shutting down the schools for the state of Ohio, and I have um, a large amount. I have 102 of my population of nurses uh, work for the Cincinnati Public School Systems, and I said, well, Jenny, what are you about to do? I immediately turned on and prayed and said, God, give me the direction. I went right back to work. I told the health commissioner, it's time to stand up a command center. So I stood up an ICS command center, um, and I pulled every single last one of my nurses in, who are now all working remotely, but I pulled them into the auditorium, and I got them on phones. And I, I think that as we continue as leaders in this way, to ensure that our staff, because I, I feel like now, and that was March the 14th I did that, and I stood up my command center, my team was so relaxed and relieved that I had a plan in place that I was able to act and do what we needed to do. And I keep telling them we're going to fight this COVID fight. So that is the end of all of my three questions, but I will say to stay grounded and to push pause, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. That was very enlightful. And now we're going to play a video from one of our panelists that was unable to attend. She sent her video in, um, Nurse Rhonda. As a frontline nurse, given the current circumstances of the constant exposure to pressure, the fears, the exhaustion, the fatigue and the ongoing stress that's related to the current outbreak of COVID-19 is kind of explains it as an experience of being in a constant state of crisis management. Working in healthcare, we see the effects of COVID-19 on our peers and on our patients and on our loved ones on a day-to-day -day basis. You turn on the TV and there is continuous coverage of COVID-19. The constant exposure can actually be very overwhelming at times. One has to manage their own personal stress and make sure that they are taking care of themselves in order to provide optimum care to others. I manage my own personal stress by, and self-care by actually doing things that I enjoy, such as relaxing activities, like spending time with my husband, reading a good book, watching a movie on TV, listening to music, um, eating healthy, taking a spa day, going for a walk, uh, talking to my animals, I actually have a dog and two cockatiels, um, or just chatting with my family through video chat. I try to find the humor in little things in everyday life my advice to frontline nurses would actually be to make time daily to enjoy your favorite relaxing activities. Make sure you eat healthy. Reach out to someone for assistance. You're not alone. If you're struggling with self-care and stress management, reach out to someone. Our organization, Volunteers of America, currently offers our staff either group or individualized uh, support that can help with stress management. Don't be afraid to reach out and talk to somebody. And remember to find the humor in the little things. So we encountered many challenges during the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, two of the main challenges I'd like to discuss are kind of intertwined, and that's communication and staffing. So I want to talk about staffing first. Staff availability became very limited. Um, the available staff that did work, they worked a lot of hours, a lot of days in a row to just make sure that our patients received the care that they deserved, which oftentimes led to staff exhaustion. We were also so busy providing that care that we didn't have the time to reach out to the family members, 
to give them updates on their loved one that was staying at the facility. This led to heightened fears and um, it also, you know, led to emotional outbursts from the family members. Remember, there were many times that the nurses would receive a phone call from a family member that was upset and they would scream and yell at these nurses that were already exhausted from all the hours that they had put in. On the other end of the spectrum though, imagine if you were the family member and your loved one was in a facility that um, you hear there's an outbreak of COVID and you're not allowed to visit due to the federal regulations and the restrictions for visitations but you don't hear from anybody for a couple of days about your loved one. I mean, I can understand how that can be very upsetting and it can heighten those fears and anxiety. Um, so the experience actually gave us the opportunity to create an avenue of communication for our family members. So a call center was actually created so that when family members called, they can actually speak to a live operator and that live operator was able to let them know that um, we would reach out to them as soon as possible. They also categorized these calls so that we would know who the appropriate person was to return the phone calls. And we took turns following up, you know, returning these phone calls um, and talking to these family members, which decreased a lot of the anxiety and the fears that the family members were experiencing. Some of the other challenges also included um, having those difficult conversations with family members about the uh, end of life choices for their loved ones as they were transitioning to the end of their life. We worked as hard as we could to try and save lives, um, but to have so many lives lost in such a short time frame can be very challenging for anyone. It is very devastating sometimes. It tends to make one feel helpless, um, but as a nurse, our experiences can also be helpful. We analyze our challenges and our experiences and which can you know, actually produce new guidelines, new protocols or new systems or new standards that can be very beneficial um, in the future guiding other healthcare workers. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to share my story. As a director of nursing in a long-term skilled care facility, I have many responsibilities and obligations as a leader. These obligations are to my peers and to my patients. As an RN, I have a duty to provide the best care that I can. We came so limited on our staff availability that the nursing management actually took uh, turns doing shifts to help provide that direct patient care. We worked side by side with our nursing staff. One night I was actually working on our designated unit for our COVID positive patients and I had multiple patients that were actually transitioning to the end of their life. They were dying. They chose not to have ventilation, they only chose comfort measures such as oxygen and medications if needed. They chose to treat in place. I worked all night listening to the agonal breathing, the gasping for air, and the noise from the oxygen concentrators that were turned up. It was heart-wrenching. It was heart-wrenching to see and hear as the CNA and I provided that comfort and that compassionate care. It took everything I had not to cry. It reminded me of my loved ones that I have lost in the last few years. I struggled because as a leader, I'm supposed to be that strong support for that CNA and that patient that is dying. It occurred to me that it was actually an honor to assist that CNA in providing that compassionate care and to provide that comfort to our patient as they died with dignity. The only advice that I could probably provide is that make sure you provide compassionate care. Make sure you respect patients' choices. 
Make sure you recognize your own limitations. Make sure you use good coping mechanisms and don't ever be afraid to reach out for help. We are now going to um, have Rose DeRosa to answer the four, the three questions. Hello, hi. Um, okay, so for the first question, um, as far as important, it's important to take control of our mental health and try our best to focus on self-care when we're away from work. Um, we have to protect ourselves first in order to best serve our patients. Um, I try to do the same thing, assess how I'm feeling to help my nurses, because self-care for the nurses is more important than ever, especially now during the pandemic. As far as for me, um, I, my self-care is I try to spend time with my husband. My daughter's in Los Angeles, so we video chat and talk a lot, but also to do the things that I really enjoy when I go home from working, which um, I'm not listening to the news, I'm reading more. I try to listen to the news maybe 30 minutes a day because I just find it's too much for me when I go home. I also um, go outdoors as much as I can. I also have a dog that I walk a lot. Um, I like to cook. I'm just doing more enjoyable things. I'm also finding that um, I'm sleeping more, and I think it's important to get a lot of sleep. My nurses, too, they do six to two here. Um, well, you didn't read my bio, but I'll just tell you a little bit about what I do right now. Um, I work in an opioid, I'm the nurse manager of an opioid uh, dependent population. We have 150 patients that are inpatient. I also do, for the VOA, I work at one of their OMH housing programs for um, young adults that have uh, maxed out of foster care. And um, I do that on the weekends. And also other older adults that, adults that have comorbidity in the housing program. So um, the other thing I try to do with my nurses is if they need it, to encourage to talk to other mental health resources and other healthcare professionals and staff that can understand their struggle. Um, they're providing, I know OASAS and um, other sources are providing a lot of mental health providers and people that you can talk to for frontline providers. Um, our, I like personally, I share, I've been sharing a lot of my stuff with the staff and also with other medical professionals that I happen to have in my family. Um, my brother's a doctor and that helps me too. Even though he's in Georgia, he's not in New York City because we're getting hit so hard here. It's been really, really um, strenuous for the nurses. Um, and I just try to be there for them as much as I can, as well as um, for our clients. Um, the stresses that I'm finding, the common stresses that we're finding is workload and, immer and emotional strain. Um, and the stresses of only, it's always like that in nursing, but I'm finding it's been magnified by the pandemic. Um, right now, my nurses were working on 50% staff because uh, a nurse is sick, another one's husband, unfortunately, has been on a ventilator for six weeks. He's, um, was, he's a cop. And um, then I have another nurse that's just too old to come in and has a lot of comorbidity. So um, my nurses, we've been working with 50% nursing staff right now, and that's been really challenging. Um, because of the shortage of staff, uh, we do the same thing. We assess every morning and talk about our fears. We're trying to educate the clients more because, like I said, a lot of the clients that we have, they are, they're not wearing their masks. They're not social distancing. Um, it's very hard to educate them. I think some of them are um, just not getting the, the real importance of the social distancing. So that's been really difficult because of the li they are living, they don't have their own living space, actually. So that's been very difficult. The other thing that we're seeing is an increase in drug and alcohol use in the patients here. Um, last month, we've had two overdoses, but it wasn't fatal overdoses. But a lot of our clients are turning to drugs and alcohol. And even though they're not supposed to be going out, they always kind of 
find a, unless it's an emergency, we've been trying to keep them in only go into specialty clinics, but they do find a way of getting drugs into the facility. And that's been really challenging because on top of the day-to-day -day activity that we have here, um, and then you have to deal with overdoses or someone that needs to be sent out because we're worried about the substances that they take in during the day. So that's been really challenging as well. Um, and as far as the last question with things that I've experienced through my nursing career, um, the, the most thing that I could say is as far as I was a nurse since 1981, I was just out of nursing school. So I did, when I first came out, I was in medicine and that's when AIDS was coming out. And this is what this is, re is reminding of. It wasn't even AIDS at that time. It was fever of unknown origin. It was, uh, it was grids. Nobody even knew it was AIDS. And I remember um, they didn't know if it was airborne. They didn't know how you even got it. And I was one of the nurses that was, that was a frontline nurse then going into and um, just caring for the, these terminal patients. And um, it just brings back a lot of memory of all I can say is that uh, my resilience and that nurses are resilient and to um, just be there for the clients and as much as we can and just for ourselves too and for the other nurses. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rose. And now we're going to turn it over to Donna Webb. Thank you, Tanya. Well, first of all, I, I feel strongly that support and encouragement is essential both before and during an outbreak in our facilities. We really need to approach these situations with fresh eyes, ask our people what they need develop our response based on the needs they've expressed and effectively and compassionately communicate with them. These are very uneasy times for all. Even though as healthcare providers, we understand what needs to be done, we know we don't have all the tools to do it the way we were trained. We can provide support and encouragement to all of our team members by creating a supportive work culture which provides a safe environment for staff to openly discuss vulnerability, stress, burnout, and any other barriers to their well being. Having the hard conversations, and they are hard, related to having access to appropriate personal protective equipment, being exposed to COVID 19 at work, and taking the infection home to their families feeling uncertain whether their organizations would support or take care of their personal and family needs if they were to become infected. It's wise for leaders to check out what is available so they can communicate uh, that type of support with their employees. Having access to childcare during increased work hours and school closures, possibly having discussions around getting support for other personnel and family needs, such as food and lodging, as work hours and demands increase. These are all realities that staff worry about. And in, in this pandemic, when our staff are working these long hours, it is our responsibility to address these concerns with our employees as we want them to be able to work additional hours and at least provide suggestions for solutions to their possible concerns. We can't fix it all, but maybe we can provide suggestions to assist them. Another aspect of support and encouragement would include enabling cooperation and collaboration between management, departments, and all staff that leads to an overall culture of support and encouragement during these trying times. You may encounter a few leadership employees who are equally concerned at this time and also need support being transparent and as proactive as possible does help us guide our teams during the, this pandemic. Lastly, we need to remember we need to be present, visible, and available. During a crisis, leaders should be accessible because it's not always possible to walk around our facilities and talk to all of our staff in person. 
we need to let employees know how they can best reach us with any updates or questions. Particularly during a crisis, employees have a need to hear from their leaders frequently. When leaders appear calm, concerned, knowledgeable, and in charge, staff feel encouraged and are more likely to have confidence that things are under control and will be fine. Some of the challenges and experiences, well, there are many challenges that our nurses are experiencing during these unprecedented times. Some of the challenges include the inability to follow best practices or clinical standards. For example, as nurses, we all know we're taught rigorous infection control and prevention practices as it relates to transmission-based precautions. Currently, our nurses are having to discount their training and follow crisis guidelines when performing care for our residents. Using face masks that are not typically approved for best practice and using the guidance for face mask reuse. Who would have ever thought that as a nurse, we would use one face mask, if we're lucky per day, to take care of individuals with transmission-based precautions. Another challenge is the lack of supplies and PPEs to do our job correctly and effectively. As nurses, we know that the current practices will assist in reducing some negative outcomes. However, they are not anywhere near, any way near what we have been taught and what we know is the best standard of practice. In addition, we have to make some difficult ethical decisions in the current pandemic situation. These range from not having families near while a resident is actively dying up to a point of determining which medications and treatment that were prescribed may now be determined non-essential in order for us to provide minimal care with minimal staff. Staff are scared, staff are anxious, and once a COVID positive resident is identified, there are staff who are scared to come to work. Um, they're scared to come back to the facility. This is our reality. As far as some advice um, to be able to give, we have seen the impact on our team members, their families, and the residents they care for. Long-term care has a deeper impact than most realize. The residents we take care of are part of our family. Their family is part of our family. We know their children, grandchildren, and so many others as their loved one is with us longer than a typical hospital stay. Our staff and our nurses are experiencing loss every day. Loss of their residents, loss of a family member, and loss of normalcy of life. The impact goes deep, and we know that all are experiencing some level of loss. We need to take one day at a time. As leaders, we need to think positive. A leader's attitude is contagious. Leaders are truly dealers in hope. Even in extreme crisis, an upbeat, can-do attitude really keeps people going. We need to remember to take a break and take care of ourselves. It's amazing what five minutes can do. We need to prioritize and focus. Every day brings new challenges and unfortunately loss until this pandemic is resolved. Having a focus for the day helps, keep, helps our team to move forward. We need to talk and communicate. This is so important. Everyone has fears and we need to be open and honest and support each other during these times. And then finally, we need to remember to celebrate the small successes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Donna. We have a question um, in our chat from one of our guests and um, to the nurses that's on the panel and it states, do the panelists have suggestions for how coworkers, chaplain in my case, can support our nurses best? particularly in a culture where our nurses are all about, I'm fine, take care of someone else. So um, any one of our panelists that wants to jump in and answer that question, please feel free. Uh, 
Hello. Um, this is Jenny, Virginia Scott, um, Cincinnati Health Department. I would say sometimes, and that's what we do as nurses, we say we're okay and we just keep going. Well, how I would tackle that is is to look at those nonverbal cues because a lot of times we say one thing and we feel another and we show it all over our face. Um, I, I would say still lean in with that person and lean in with your team and really maybe start thinking outside of the box of what you can actually do. Are we huddling daily? Are you are you even asking things to separate from? Um, I think one of the other panelists had talked about it. Um, say, what what's the last book you all read? Or try to tap into something else that's outside of COVID, and you probably can get a chance to um, break in a little bit. Because I think sometimes when we keep that overarching um, daily flow and especially with the COVID talk, that it keeps them the opportunity to block and continue to suppress what they're really going through. So that is just something that I will add. And, and I think that the other panelists um, have spoken some great self-care tools. And if we use that and turn it into a different way as a conversation piece, I think you will start to um, have them open up and unfold to take off those layers. Would any of the other panelists like to add to that? Cindy, you can hop in as well if you would like to add. <laughs> okay, we have, oh, sorry. All I can say is, um, wow, you know, what an incredible group of um, nurse leaders that have already spoken. And, and I think Virginia is exactly right. Um, we have to look behind, behind the words to see what's really true. And, um, you know, look for that human connection. That's usually the place where we can start to share our vulnerability. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. We have another question. Um, this question, what is your expert opinion surrounding recent protesters saying this is a fake crisis? I'm sure everyone wants to jump in on this one. <laughs> I'm telling you, here I go again, you know, because speaking from this public health standpoint, um, I think that when we continue to watch the curve and our numbers are steadily increasing, um, I cringe when I watch the news and, and I'm watching the protesters and I think about our nurses on the front line and I think about some of our hospitals don't have PPE and I just think that so many times as nurses, we get calls from family members and everyone saying, can you help me with this? I coughed up this, I this and that. I said, do they understand the amount of level of disrespect and, 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 and hurt feeling that we can actually, that, that you are putting off on what we call in everyone, our heroes, our, our medical staff is our heroes, but then you will go out there and protest against the state that's actually trying to protect you. It, it, it makes you feel like we're trying to help you protect you against yourself at this point. Um, and I, I think that all the states are trying to do their best to show exactly what is going on. And, and I, I hear a lot of, oh, those numbers aren't true. And, and if anyone follow me on Facebook, I do share the daily numbers that's moving and, and the targets. And if you look at the spread rate and you, and you think about if one person having, that means they could potentially have infected, exposed to other people and the citizens. And, and I'm like, do they not understand that piece? And then I start thinking, what else could we could have done to educate um, everyone? And I, I think we have shown all the all the pictures of um, patients on ventilators, and and you hear in heartfelt um, stories of spouses that they can't even go. Um, to the funeral services, the homegoing services for their loved ones. And, and I said, can we share? I don't know what else we can share to show them that this is, this is a really rough time that we're trying to do what we can do. And sometimes we can't, they, they have to understand we're not going to put a dollar amount on the cost of a life, and that's what it is. And I, I sit back and I think that we can close our businesses, and I know you're not working, but you're living. And I think if we can just get to that point and just get down to that um, that human point, that 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 piece again. Like, but you're breathing. What are you going to do in the grave if you have all the money in the world? And I think sometimes if our states could just say the simple piece, like just tell them, like, but you're living. But uh, that's all. I, I that's something that I, I have to deal with every day. Every day 
at 2 o'clock, uh, we're on a call with CDC and ODH, and um, and I, I just wonder sometimes if they really understand, do they really see the amount of work that's going on. Thank you. Would any of the other nurses like to add? Okay, I would like to say th thank you so much. This was a great panel. We had great discussion, great dialogue. And as you can see from the nurses, this is real. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Al. Thank you, Tanya. Hi, everyone. First, I just want to lift up to Rose DeRosa. Rose, I apologize. Uh, your bio was right in front of me and I missed it. And thank you so much for catching us up. I really appreciate it. So uh, just offering much gratitude to you and an apology, particularly your passion and your work during the early AIDS epidemic. And I can only imagine what, what life was like for you then and what you're revisiting now. So we, I thank you personally for your sacrifice. Uh, just a reminder that I'll be introducing Cinda and during her, she'll be responding more if she wishes regarding the panel sharing, but then also during her time, if you want to post uh, questions in chat, Rita will be addressing those and sharing them with Cinda as appropriate. And so I just want to remind everyone that we're thrilled to have Cinda Hyden Rushton back with us today. She is the Anne and George L. Bunting Professor of Clinical Ethics in the Berman Institute of Bioethics and the School of Nursing at Johns Hopkins University. She has a joint appointment in the School of Medicine's Department of Pediatrics. A founding member of the Berman Institute, Dr. Rushton co-chairs the Johns Hopkins Hospital's Ethics Consultation Service. An international leader in nursing ethics, in 2014, Dr. Rushton co-led the first National Nursing Ethics Summit, convened at the Johns Hopkins Berman Institute of Bioethics and School of Nursing. The summit supported by strategic partners for nine national nursing organizations and seven collaborating organizations developed a blueprint for 21st century nursing ethics. Dr. Rushton's current scholarship in clinical ethics focuses on moral distress and suffering of clinicians, the development of moral resilience, designing a culture of ethical practice, and conceptual foundations of integrity, respect, trust, and compassion. She's the author of Moral Resilience, Transforming Moral Suffering in Healthcare. Again, Cinda, we're just thrilled you took time to be with us and participate today. You're muted. You're muted, Cinda. Um, thank you, Al. And I, I just want to say um, I stand proud with my nursing colleagues. Um, everything that you've heard uh, from, from Rhonda and Rose and Donna um, and everyone this morning has just been uh, a testament to what it means to be a nurse. And so I, I just want to say how grateful I am that you're doing what you're doing because um, this is what nursing is all about. So thank you. And I have no doubt that uh, Flo would be extremely proud uh, to hear what you're doing and how you're responding. I, um, I feel like our panelists really provided a lot of wisdom and um, I, I, feel like there's so much wisdom in what was said already that I just want to kind of um, amplify a couple of points. One is this um, very clear message of we can't take care of others if we don't take care of ourselves. And, um, you know, in the work that I do, um, I like to, to remind us that taking care of ourselves is not optional. In our ANA Code of Ethics, our first, fourth provision is very clear that we have the same obligations to self as to others. And I think what you've heard so far today is, is an example of that kind of investment and self-stewardship that recognizes uh, our own limitations with compassion, 
but also prioritizes our well-being by um, doing the things that actually nourish us. And it's not a recipe, it's not a prescription, but it's a, an individual discernment to be able to figure out what is it that I need today to be able to support my sense of wholeness, my sense of health um, in the midst of these really challenging times. And so in one way, I think this, this uh, pandemic is an opportunity as nurses for us to um, really turn toward that and to prioritize that our well-being matters. And um, we are, as you've heard Virginia talk about and others, um, we are doers. And if we give, 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 give. But when the well is dry, there's nothing to give. So we've got to really pay attention to our own signals, to knowing what our limits are, knowing when we need to step back, when we do need to pause and to really reflect and to notice, you know, what is my body telling me? And I think right now for all of us, uh, but particularly those of you at the front line, it's really easy to sort of habitually override those signals and to sort of dismiss them. Um, you know, the comment about, oh, we're fine. That's what we, that's just what we do. I hear that all the time. But actually, um, we all have limitations. So I just wanted to, to um, highlight that. Um, the other thing that, um, you know, when you think about the accumulation of all of these stressors, um, all of these, uh, the grief that we heard, um, every aspect of our life has changed. And so there is a lot of grief. There's grief around um, practicing in the way that we used to practice and how we are practicing now. There's grief in the loss of our relationships and the ways that we have connected with one another. Um, and at the same time, I think um, one of the things that we have to really pay attention to is not to allow that to erode our sense of empathy and compassion. And um, right now, you know, if you think about how it is that, that we respond to the needs of, of others, often it involves um, attuning to the other person, both their emotions, their um, nonverbal communication. And we have, now we have all this protective equipment around us often all that people see are our eyes. And so it's, it means that we have to, to actually pay attention in different ways so that we can stay connected to that, that ability to empathize. And so it may mean that we have to um, step back more often and to try to imagine not only what am I experiencing, but what is this person experiencing? Um, dying alone, not having their family members with them, um, not being able to communicate in the ways that we are used to. Um, so making that a practice so that we can pause after each time we've had an encounter with a patient to have a way to, to um, end that encounter so that we can be prepared for the next one, but to also honor what has just happened in, in whatever communication you've had so that you can kind of keep that sense of um, awareness about um, how, how can we actually serve others in the midst of all of this. So those are just some, some you know, sort of high level thoughts. Um, one of the things I, I, would like to offer today is um, um, I have uh, had the privilege for many years of teaching with Roshi Joan Halifax and Roshi Joan has created a model of compassion that's based on five elements that she has created um, that with the mnemonic of grace, G-R-A-C-E. And what I'd like to offer today is um, how you might use grace um, to be able to confront these challenges in a way that keeps us connected and creates the condi conditions for compassion to arise. 
So the elements of grace, the first one, G, is gathering our attention. And you've heard this several times in what you've heard from our nursing colleagues. Gathering our attention, being able to take a breath, focusing on the breath so that we can actually clear our, our minds enough to think clearly and to focus our attention away from all the distracting things um, that are around us, but being able to come back to just noticing our breath. And that can be in just one moment, a breath, an inhale, and an exhale. The R of grace is recalling our intention. And so after we've gathered our attention in the next breath, as we inhale, we can remember why we're here. Why am I doing this work in the first place? And being connected to our intention, whether that's to relieve suffering or to provide equitable, uh, compassionate care, Connecting to that intention and those values um, gives us an anchor as we interact with others and do our work. Uh, and, it, and it really is a, a resource. I know for myself, um, being connected to why am I here um, helps to focus my attention, but also to be able to um, resource me when I need some, some support. The A of grace, is um, attuning first to ourselves, which might seem a little counterintuitive because we're always focused on the other. But um, the A of grace is to tune in first to how am I right now in this moment? How, how am I showing up? What am I bringing into this room, into this conversation? And is it full of fear? Is it uh, a feeling of helplessness? Is it a, a sense of hope? What am I bringing myself into this encounter? And then the second part of A is attuning to the other. And that's what I was just speaking about in terms of empathy, being able to attune to enlarge our, our awareness to include the other person. What might they actually be experiencing? And how can I uh, understand and uh, respond to that? The C of grace is considering what will serve. And considering what will serve is a really um, fruitful place for us to let go of our um, opinions and what we think ought to happen and to try to touch into what will really serve in this circumstance, which may be not what I want. Um, it may be that, um, for example, we don't have the resources that we normally would to uh, accompany a dying person but there's other things that we can do. And so considering what will serve is, is, is to really consider, um, given all the constraints, given everything that is true right now in this situation, what is something that I can do that actually would serve this person or this situation? And then the E of grace is... Um, going from considering to actually enacting, to taking the step to move from considering to action, and to doing that in a way that is actually really connected to our ethical values and our ethical um, foundation, to do it in a way that is respectful, that is compassionate, and that is just. And so this mnemonic um, of grace is a, is a, resource that we can use for any encounter that we're having, whether it's with our colleagues, uh, whether it's with a family member, whether it's with one of our patients. Um, it's, a, it's a tool that, that can help us to be able to be compassionate in the midst of a situation where one of the things that can, can be a casualty is the loss of empathy and compassion. Um, and that extends to ourselves and to our colleagues, but also to the people that we're serving. So that's what I'd like to offer today. I don't know if Rita, do you have other questions you'd like to be to answer or? One of the questions that uh, came up on the chat was, 
uh, if you're in the context of working with nursing students mm -hmm. and they're terrified around the virus and, and the whole pandemic situation, how do you, how would you work with them to keep encouraging them to look toward a future in nursing? Well, um, while this pandemic has, has stretched all of us, this is the reality of our world. And so part of it is how do we help them to develop some of these skills in being able to um, work with their fear and their anxiety in, in constructive ways. And, and I know for myself, um, I, I really want to um, invite our students to into the reality, not to, not to pretend that it's easy or that this is gonna go away, but rather what are some very specific things that we can do. And so this model of grace may be one of them, but also the ability to te help them to begin to notice what their own um, signals are in their body when fear shows up, when anxiety shows up, and some simple ways that they can recognize that and how they can shift their attention um, with uh, practices like um, being able to ground ourselves by noticing our feet on the floor, being able to, to just have some, some um, simple practices that help us to reground ourselves when we find ourselves our nervous system becoming so dysregulated. Um, it's also, I think, we have to be we have to be honest about um, the circumstances that are required from our profession, and um, to give them the tools to communicate their concerns, um, giving them uh, practice in communicating those concerns and also um, helping them to, um, to be good advocates for themselves and for the people that they're serving. Thank you. Um, I, I, I think, uh, first of all, I wanna thank all the nurses who um, shared so powerfully and honestly and um, also wisely. Mm -hmm. uh, about what it's like to stay in a profession that is so important and so valuable to society, uh, but also carries profound risks. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's a lot of kinds of work that don't carry the same, same level of risk, and yet uh, that so many continue to do it to me is, a, is an inspiration. Um, my, my own mother was a nurse, uh, so this is a personal thing for me. Uh, she was trained by the Japanese Red Cross and worked in an army hospital in Fukuoka, Japan, where she met both my fathers. Um, so uh, I became an American because of her career in nursing. Um, and uh, when she came to the United States, she wasn't, her, her license wasn't recognized. Um, and I'm not sure why she chose not to try to do an American educational process, but she wound up working a lot as a nurse's aide. Uh, and uh, I think she was very proud of the fact that she was often, when hospitals were busy, she was asked to do things that nurses' aides normally can't do, but she knew how, um, and people trusted her. So, so I think she had a very satisfying and long career in nursing. Um, and so, uh, so I actually know a little bit about medicine from hearing her talk about stuff she was doing um, in her work. Uh, and uh, so, I, so for that, I'm really grateful. Uh, and I want to I want to say a little bit about the consequences of not doing self care, mm -hmm. because um, I work on the edge of moral distress as it leads into moral injury. And moral distress is a normal human response to difficult and challenging conditions. Mm -hmm. So when you cannot do the standard of care that you think you ought to be able to do because of circumstance, or when um, you lose people that you fought so hard to keep, um, there's a moral quality to that. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, we just, I think any kind of harm comes with a moral quality. So we have to recognize that. Even if it's a disease and nobody caused it, still, if your job is to help somebody get through a disease and they don't, then um, the loss can carry a sort of sense of failure. 
<clears throat> and it's important to know that um, and to know it's normal. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, the fact that we're moral human beings and empathetic beings means that <clears throat> moral distress is unavoidable in human life. Oh, feelings of guilt, feelings maybe even of shame or distress or loss, um, they come with the territory. Um, and uh, so the thing is to know when that's happening to you, to, to be aware of your own distress um, and to take the time to deal with it. Uh, and that may mean talking to someone about the feelings that you're carrying. Uh, it may mean um, doing some kind of self-care activity that lightens that load, which may be talking to a relative, taking a bubble bath, watching a funny show, turning the news off so there's no more distress in your life. Um, those are all, that process of self-care um, and relieving that moral distress is how we all keep going in life without that distress wrecking us. Yeah. So, so not dealing with it has serious consequences yeah. because if you don't deal with it and you just keep pushing, plowing on without stopping, it doesn't disappear. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. just go away. You can't run from it by overworking yourself or trying not to look at it. It will just sit there, and if there's a lot of it, it will just keep piling up, um, and eventually you will break. Yeah. And that break um, can mean you start drinking or using drugs to avoid the pain because now the pain has gotten so severe that it's 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 inhibiting your capacity to work or to deal with it. So you may you may wind up in a state of substance misuse or you may go emotionally flat and try not to feel anything at all uh, and just like put it away and be totally just rational and driven. Um, or you may uh, fall into a, like a deep despair uh, where you just, you just can't uh, function very well because you're, you're just disengaged. Um, and if it gets really severe, people will take their own lives. And that's, that's a tragedy because it's the person who took their life is the kind of empathetic person we want to keep in the profession and doing this kind of work. So, so uh, it's really, really important um, not to hold it in. Um, and uh, there are plenty of people available. I mean, there are now call-in centers. If you don't want to talk to anybody you know, maybe, maybe what you're struggling with is something um, you think if you talk to anyone you know, they're going to judge you in a negative way, uh, which is, an, is also a legitimate feeling, then I would suggest that calling into a call-in center, there are now a lot of, of programs where you can just call and talk to someone. Um, and uh, we're VOA right now, we're working on trying to set one up internally for VOA folks. Um, we're hoping to have that up and running in a few weeks. Um, and we're going to see how that works for our folks. And if it works well, we're, we, we'll expand it beyond Volunteers of America. Um, but that, that capacity to uh, process, to talk about um, what's going on with you is really, really important. And if you're in a situation where you're too busy to stop to have a long conversation, my recommendation is to do the breathing, to just become aware of what you're, ha you're doing, because the breathing itself will calm you down. The breathing itself is, is actually, it acts on your body to relieve the stress hormones that are also part of the distress involved. So that's important. And keep a journal. Right, right in the, if you have a few minutes uh, at the end of your shift or at some point in the time when you have time to do this, write how you're feeling. Um, write the story that happened. That just, just putting it on paper is another way that you can sort of set it aside and look at it without it having to drive your behavior the entire time. So, so the, I would say that if you want to know what the difference between moral distress and moral injury is, the too much moral distress can lead to moral injury. And moral injury is a very serious condition. Your, your character changes, um, your behavior changes, um, and people can give up on their careers, even though they love their careers and believed in them. They, it may bring them to a point of giving up on a really valuable career they've invested half their life in. 
And that's a tragedy. Um, that it's a tragedy when that happens and it doesn't have to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and there was a question about protesters around us. Um, and I, I am also uh, feeling that same sense of frustration that people aren't paying attention to protecting other people from themselves because they may be asymptomatic and be carriers, um, but they're also not protecting themselves and their families by going out in these public ways and protesting and not wearing masks and doing those sorts of behaviors. And I think that um, it's really important to understand that often when people are that angry, that outraged, they may be acting out their own sense of moral injury. Um, it's because one of the things that can happen with moral injury is that you um, may feel like a failure or humiliated by circumstances in your life that uh, you didn't necessarily cause, but now you, you can't have the life you thought you were going to have, or you, you can't do what you need to do to feed your family, because lots of people are out, a quarter of the population practically is out of work. Uh, it's, it's really hard. Um, and, uh, and one way people act out their sense of um, failure or shame is to be angry, is to be angry at what caused it. And that whatever you think caused it, it's often um, a failure of, of uh, a, a economic system, a healthcare system, a leadership system that didn't make it possible for you to live the life you thought you should have. Um, and that can show up, and, and we've now seen, I think one of the things with COVID-19 is that it, it has exposed um, for all to see aspects of um, the lack of social welfare, an inadequate healthcare system, an inadequate economic system for um, everyone to have a decent life and job. Uh, we're now seeing the, in an exaggerated form in COVID-19, the kind of suffering that comes from life circumstances that make you feel like you don't have the life you deserve or the life that you thought you would have. And that can show up as a fierce kind of outrage or anger. Um, and it can be diffuse. It can be like, you don't know why you feel that way. You just feel that way. And so you act it out. So I think it's really important to understand that, uh, it, of course, some of the protesters we know were funded to, to do those protests. But a lot of people are sincerely upset and sincerely angry that they are without work and they're on the edge of poverty. Um, and losing their homes and uh, all of those sorts of things. So it, I don't think it really is very productive to get angry back. Um, it, it's not a useful response to other people's anger. Um, it just tends to get, get everybody more polarized and stuck. So uh, I don't have a fix for the protesters. I don't have a solution to the risks that they're taking and that they're putting other people at risk for. Um, but if you get a chance to talk to somebody who, who doesn't like the rules and doesn't want to follow them in a one-to-one in -one way, I would ask them just why, what, what happened to them? Um, and to try to, instead of uh, escalate their anger, try to get them to just talk about how other feelings they may be having beyond the anger. Um, and that, that can help um, that you might actually be able then to have a real conversation with them and listen and share and share your own fears about why the protests are you, that may be provoking in you a kind of anxiety. So, so those, are, those are some of the things I've been thinking about in relation to the protests that have been going on and the way we all feel threatened by um, the behavior of our own fellow citizens uh, in public. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely happening, um, and, uh, and, we, and I'm trying to figure out a way that I can be more helpful in my response to it beyond um, just being angry at them for doing that, because um, it's, um, it's not, it doesn't stop them. It just stirs up my stress to be angry about it. Um, so I'm trying to talk myself out of my angry reactions to things. Um, so do we have, an, Al, you've been moderating the chat. Do we have other um, questions? Yeah, we do. Yeah. I was 
mentioned a couple of questions, and there's two that really kind of stand out, and they kind of go your direction. Paul writes, what is your opinion about end-of-life decisions for patient, uh, patients on palliative care who still desire aggressive symptoms management during this time, but doctors do not see, see it that way, rather offering hospice care? For the nurse and staff, it seemed to be a moral and emotional dilemma. What can you say to the staff or nurse to be able to manage her care and be graceful to herself? It's a great question. And um, that's yours. <laughs> that's Cinda's, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, it's really interesting right now to, because of the, um, scarcity of resources and you know we're, we're sort of in the in the phase of both um, contingency planning and crisis management that um, our our ways of making decisions are shifting and I think part of what this question highlights is that our typical uh, ethical framework is one that's really focused on uh, asking our patients and their families what their preferences are and acting on them. And what may be part of this is that in a crisis and contingency framework, um, the, the ability to actually offer all of the resources that we have in the past may, may be limited. So for me, I, my, first inclination is I want to know more. To, so the first is to be curious and to ask questions about, you know, of the physician who is saying no, you know, hospice care. I think there's a lot of questions that we could ask about, um, help me understand how you're weighing the benefits and burdens and what, you know, how are you making that determination? What, what's going into that uh, assessment? And I think as nurses, we have a lot to offer to that conversation. Um, most of the time, you are the ones who have the most direct and sustained involvement with the patient and the family and understanding their preferences and their goals and why they may be asking for certain things. And on the other hand, it's important to understand, are there new constraints that limit what we can actually offer in these circumstances? And I think that's as hard a conversation as you know, one of sort of um, trying to get from a patient what their actual goals of care are, to say, you know, I understand that this is what you prefer, but right now we're actually not able to offer that because we are in this, you know, unusual situation. Um, but here's what we can offer. And I think the place of being able to have integrity in the midst of that is to be able to acknowledge our limitations and to do it with honesty and compassion, but also to be able to not abandon our patients at that time. So to, to, to focus on, if we're not able to do this, here is what we actually can do. And one of the things that I think we can promise patients uh, is that we will accompany them through that process. And even that sometimes may have some limitations right now. I know a lot of nurses are really struggling with the limits that they have available to, to actually provide the kind of end of life care that they feel is respectful and dignified of people. Um, there's something very out of order to have patients be separated from their loved ones if that's something that is important to them. So I think this is a really rich place for us to, to you know, as a, as a group, as a community, maybe the people on your unit to really talk about what's different now and what is the same and what promises can we actually make to patients right now and how can we communicate that in a, in a way that is both clear and honest um, but also compassionate. Thank you, Cinda. Next question is from Tom for you, Cinda. How can you help, or how can leadership maybe, help nursing teams build healthy cohesion for supporting each other? Do you have a thought around that? And I, I really appreciate that question because, um, you know, our, our emotions are contagious. 
in both directions, positive and negative. And um, I think this is a time where it's really important to put in place some, some practices and some pauses during the day where we can connect as human beings and where we can huddle together and to connect to positive emotions. And one of the great ones that helps us a lot is gratitude. So, you know, having those pauses during the day where the team stands together and everyone says a word of something they're grateful for. And it's interesting to watch what that does in our bodies and in our psyche. Because when our, our whole nervous system is overwhelmed by negative, by all the challenges, all the negative of what we can't do, it keeps us stuck in a pretty rigid place that shuts us down our ability to actually connect with one another. So creating spaces where we can, can actually do that. And, um, and I, I will share with um, Rita and Al some resources that we've developed um, to use as a, as a team to talk about one thing that was hard and one thing that was good today. So at the end of the day, to acknowledge both, but to pay attention to what happens in our bodies as we connect to each other's good uh, experiences and how we can use that as a resource to help us shift from the despair and the challenge to saying, and this is also true, and to really pay attention to acknowledging our effort, even if the outcome that we hoped for did not happen. There's something important about actually honoring that I tried my best, even in these really challenging situations, and I can be proud of what I accomplished, even in this circumstance. Very, very good. Thank you. Much appreciated. I have another question uh, for you, Cinda. And actually, Rita, this may be something you want to reflect on and respond to as well. Elizabeth writes, what do you recommend for supporting the families and loved ones of nurses? And then she shares her context of the question. I primarily work with military, but a lot of my work is now trying to support military spouses who are also nurses or other frontline professions facing COVID-19 while balancing deployments. Wow. Uh, first, uh, Cinda, maybe your thoughts. And if you have something, Rita, that would be great. Well, I have to to fully disclose that I don't have any experience in the military. So I'm going to let, I'm going to let Rita talk about that part. But I, I think um, there's got to be, uh, you know, think about the accumulation of stressors. There's the stress of our job in, in general. There's the now the COVID on top of that. And then another, you know, stressor of deployment has got to really put people in a situation where it's likely that it's their um, resources to deal with that is going to be exceeded. And so I think some of it is how do we intensify and individualize what, what kinds of supports we can put in place, peer to peer support, um, support systems from um, organizations. I know a lot of organizations are intensifying their um, availability of mental health services and behavioral health um, because of these kinds of accumulation of, of stressors. And I think one of the most important things is to encourage people, to, as was said earlier in this, in this webinar, we have, to, we have to dissolve the sense of shame that comes along with asking for help. And sometimes the most important thing we can do is to bear witness to and listen to our, our family members and our, our colleagues, but also to support them in a non-judgmental way that um, there are resources and that, that it, for me, integrity is about recognizing our limitations and, and not turning away from that and saying, I need help in managing this. I'm in a situation that's beyond what I can really manage right now. And I need some additional supports. Um, and I think that's a way that we can help um, family members who are trying to support the people at the front line too. Rita, I'm sure you have something more to offer. 
Yeah. Um, well, the thing I thought of immediately, um, if you have somebody on deployment, or for example, if you're the a family of a medical caregiver who's chosen to stay in a hotel and not come home to keep from infecting their family, and a lot of medical caregivers have made that choice as they're afraid of infecting their families, that what happens is that whoever else is, is, the, is a parent or in charge of the rest of the family has to take on the duties of the person who's missing. Mm -hmm. And they may never have had to do that before. I remember when I was um, in seventh grade, my father, for the first time that in my childhood, left our family on a deployment for a year. And, and we had to leave the military base on top of him leaving the family because they, they kick you out of base housing if the soldier isn't there. So we went to live with his family in Mississippi. Um, and my mother actually had to learn to drive. She, she didn't know how to drive at that point. So she had to learn to drive and she had to learn to take care of us. And I don't actually know what all the stresses were that she went through because my brother was also an infant at the time. But having, our, having my stepfather's family around us, I think was a great help to her. Um, and it, having other people in your neighborhood or in, um, in the vicinity, a uh, church community or whatever, aware, just having that person's community around them, aware that they're facing additional challenges. If you're a chaplain or, or a clergy person who's supporting people in these situations, knowing who in your community is identified as having to face these extra challenges is important. Uh, and that, that may mean getting some members of the community to help them do certain things that they may need support doing. Um, finding ways to give them relief with their children. Um, it, it, there have been stories now of parent fatigue uh, yeah. from, from some, having their kids home 24-7, which is a new experience for some of them. Um, so uh, if, if you're in a, a support role with people and families in those kind of situations, one is just helping this house unload um, and acknowledging, yes, they really do have a lot uh, and, and making that and it validating that what they're facing is challenging um, can mean a lot uh, because it clears out the need for them to act like nothing's wrong. And they're okay. And that that's a really important thing that they, that they understand um, uh, and you may be able to give them strategies for handling stress better if they're not used to handling that load of stress. Um, some tips around that or checking, just checking in with them um, periodically to, you need anything that's going on, uh, it, you know, because stuff happens all the time. Um, so those are, when I was uh, 16, my father went on another deployment, which was much worse than going to Germany for a year. He went to Vietnam. Um, and so it wasn't just that he was gone, it was that he could get killed. And um, uh, we had a, had a Baptist minister. Uh, this was after we had moved on away from the military base and were living in a civilian community. And, uh, and it just happened that my best friend in high school's dad was a Baptist minister. So I wound up belonging to this Baptist community. And he, he just came by and visited my mom a lot. Um, and because his daughter was a, you know, I was a friend of his daughter, I got invited on their family trips and, um, and did a lot of fun activities with my friend Joy in high school. Um, and I, and I, years later thinking about that, I, I realized he was deliberately stepping in, mm -hmm. in a way that really made it possible for us to survive my father doing two tours in Vietnam. Great. Yeah. So, uh, and that doesn't have to be a minister. It can be a neighbor. Yeah. It can be a family member from somewhere else. And right now, since we can't do things in person, it's calling people, organizing activities for high school kids online or all, there's sort of things that, that you can do to give people a break. Yeah. So Al, um, I'm aware that we're just about out of time. And I wanted to just, um, Tanya started us out with a really wonderful um, invocation, but I wanted to offer a, something to end us today, if that would be okay. Do we um, have 
we have any more do we have any more questions are we are well, we, we were scheduled a little bit longer, I think. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah. right. are you, can you stay with us a little bit longer, Cinda? I'm fine, but uh, yeah. But Wait, please okay. hold it and please do share it, would you? Well at the end. Okay, well here, this is, from my records, we have about 30 more minutes. Is okay. that correct, Rita? I think yeah, so. We don't have to go on and on. I mean, if, if, if there are there is at least one more question, but I think, yep. you know, the panel at the, the nurses panel went, it said so much <laughs> that, uh, exactly. that they're exactly. here to yeah. we don't Well, here's, how about if we do this? I just want to, because people don't, some folks may not know who Rita is. So I thought I would just clarify who she is. And if she has any comments that she'd like to share, and then we'll ask that final question that's hanging out there. And then in the meantime, if any of the panelists or uh, folks who are participating have a final question for, for Cinda or for Rita, we can entertain it then. And then Cinda, following, if you would end with us in a, in a reading that's appropriate, that'd be terrific. Thank you so much. Well, you have, along with Dr. Rushton, you've also been hearing from Dr. Rita Brock, Senior Vice President of Moral Injury and Director of the Shea Moral Injury Center at Volunteers of America, which we sometimes call VOA. She leads the organization's effort to deepen understanding about moral injury and the many populations that experience it. A noted theologian, Dr. Brock was the founding director of the Soul Repair Center at Bright Divinity School, Texas Christian University, where she also was research professor of theology and culture. She is co-author of Soul Repair, Recovering from Moral Injury After War, and Proverbs of Ashes, Violence, Redemptive Suffering, and the Search for What Saves Us. She is a leading national expert on moral injury. It's a to have you here, Rita. Share as you will with us. Yeah. So, well, I think I said most of what I needed to say about moral injury. Um, I mean, I could say a lot more about it in, in certain populations, but I... But I um, I've been concerned especially about the stories of suicide of medical caregivers and frontline workers recently. Um, and I think that's the tip of the iceberg. I think we're not, we're going to see the aftermath of COVID um, most deeply in the moral injury of the people who had to work on the front lines to fight it. Uh, I think we're going to see it in the culture as well. Um, partly because um, COVID's exposed so much of the suffering that was already there. It sort of, um, as I say, hit, it hit us when we were down. Um, and so the, uh, a lot of people were already struggling. And now it's put so many more people who are barely making it financially out of work uh, in the gig economy. Um, so uh, so it's, a, it's, gonna, it's gonna be... Um, a thing we're all going to face for quite some time. Um, and uh, as I said, moral distress is normal. We all experience it if we have a conscience and if we in any way fail our conscience, which I, I do probably every day, <laughs> several times a day. Um, but, uh, but if we don't have ways to uh, process those negative feelings we have about uh, things that have happened, um, then they do accumulate. Um, and what I know about working in a moral injury, we've had a couple of, uh, we've had a fairly successful pilot working with military veterans. Uh, and what I know about both trauma, and I would add that trauma has moral content. So when we talk about trauma informed care, we're also talking about moral distress in trauma. Um, and what I know about the pain of trauma and the pain of moral injury is you can't dodge it. You have to actually go through it, space into it and process it, or it will haunt you um, and it will afflict you. Um, and um, it, may, it may not mean that you take your own life, but it will affect the relationships you have in your life and um, inhibit your capacity to thrive. And, and we want everyone to thrive. Um, as, a, as a theologian, my, one of my favorite theological quotes is from a very, very early uh, Christian theologian of the second century. Um, and he said, the glory of God 
is a human being fully alive. Um, and moral injury is one of those things um, that uh, hides the glory of a human being fully alive. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it has to be dealt with. Uh, so, so that's that, that's I think enough on moral injury. I think we, okay. we all kind of get it now. <laughs> we know what it is. Okay, very good. Um, there is one final question that I thought maybe Cinda and Rita both might have some thoughts about. Uh, Gloria wrote, "I am with the Institute for Healing of Memories, and we are facilitating Zoom gatherings of support, and now want to serve healthcare workers with these." We work with trauma and moral injury in a collective healing process. Highly trained in our methodology, but we are not a clinical intervention. We would love to know how to best serve in this way and how to let healthcare workers know of these gatherings. Uh, so I, uh, um, and maybe you could answer my question in chat. One of my questions back is, are you now doing these gatherings online in some capacity or are you, um, I, I, it, I'm not clear what right now what gatherings mean. Um, and I would say that uh, Volunteers of America also does a similar thing with veterans. We've had a program that was a pilot for two years uh, called resilient strength training, and it was not a clinical program. It was not therapy. It was um, peer support, uh, and so we trained other veterans to co-facilitate groups of veterans who were struggling with moral injury, and found uh, and it was a fifty-hour process, so it was not fast, um, but. Uh, it, it was our evidence so far, we have preliminary data, the evidence is that it was very helpful to people. Um, so I respect the kind of programs you're talking about, about put, putting people together um, uh, in not necessarily with a clinical expert, but just as a way to process trauma and to process difficult memories. Um, so, uh, so we're, let's see, um, you're meeting, in person, is that right? On Zoom, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, that, that we are now, uh, if you wanna put your information about how people might join these groups, if you have a link or something in the chat, we will make sure um, uh, to uh, read it out loud so that people on this call will understand how to send people to these gatherings if, you, if they uh, might need them. Um, and uh, it, I think it's, it's terrific if, if you're, you're using this. Um, one of the interesting concepts that I have run across in my research on moral injury is from a, a literature specialist who studies the children of Holocaust literature. And she, she has an interesting observation, which I also think is really important when we start talking about healing memories. Um, she observes that sometimes the descendants or the children of people who have experienced, experienced serious trauma, and there will be an entire generation born out of this COVID crisis that will have become the children of people who went through this COVID crisis, that children who have parents who went through a serious traumatic event like the Holocaust or World War II or the Japanese internment camps um, can start to feel, because of the trauma memories, can start to feel as if their own lives are small and insignificant by comparison. That because they have comfortable, their lives have been uneventful in terms of major trauma, they may feel like, well, there's not much to their life. And they will sometimes take over the trauma of the previous generation as if it were their own and make it their life cause. And so when you talk about healing trauma memories, you may be talking about healing trauma memories over generations. Um, because as, as um, Cinda said, emotions are contagious. 
And so how parents pass on trauma to children is also an issue. So sometimes you're dealing with people who themselves didn't directly experience trauma, but you can actually have moral injury as a witness, as a bystander, as someone who observed or heard about something um, and take it on yourself in a way that can also lead you to moral distress. Um, so, do we have a, a, a way for people to learn about the Healing Memories group? It's in the chat. It's in the chat. Okay. Can you read that, Al, where, the, where they can go? Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, heal. It's uh, the, the, it's uh, let me see. Trauma Center for Victims of Torture and Violence in Cape Town in the '90s and is used all over the world. He Healing Memories, na dot org. You can uh, sign up for a newsletter where they announce their sessions or email through our contact form. So you can reach it that way. We're gonna. Um, need <laughs> there are there are. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> So there are no other questions in chat. Uh, and so it looks like that maybe we've exhausted the questions and I'm just really cognizant of people intentionally taking time of their day and their lives to be present for each other. Especially when I think of folks who are, are leading nursing teams and the demand is so high and yet being very committed to get to provide the best possible care and support for the nursing teams. We just really applaud you for intentionally taking the time to be with us today. And of course, we uh, appreciate uh, Rita and Cinda being so strong with us and such great resource. And unless you have something else, Rita, I think we'll just Give it to Cinda to share this really rich moment as we let go of our time together. Thank you. And, um, you know, I think it's a really important moment to pause um, and to honor the, you know, we have more, almost 4 million nurses in this country. And um, I think what this pandemic has made absolutely clear is that um, we cannot uh, have a healthy nation without a healthy nursing workforce. And so it's really essential that, first of all, that we acknowledge that we really can't do our jobs unless we have the support and resources that we need to be able to do that. And so I think on the one hand, it's a call to action for all of us to uh, really permanently dismantle the, the barriers that have created the kinds of distress that in some ways are avoidable. So there's, there's that piece. And then the other piece is that um, in the midst of all of that and all the challenges, there are incredible examples of nurses uh, who are using their incredible competence and their skillful and astute assessment. Uh, we talked about doing self-assessment, their courage and tenacity and compassion on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think one of the things that I would hope we could walk away with is not overlooking the power of our presence. And, um, you know, when we have nothing else in terms of physical resources, we always have that. And um, that's a huge uh, blessing for many people. So I want to just leave you, I don't know who wrote this, but um, I have found these phrases to be really important right now. And you might want to think about using these um, at the beginning of your shift or at the end of your shift um, to, to kind of help orient yourself toward um, how you want to show up. Strengthen me to see the wonder of my work through the eyes of those I serve. Enable me to serve others with respect, compassion, humility, courage, and love. 
And let my light, let my work be a light to those in need and a beacon of hope for those who despair. So I offer that as a um, kind of medicine for all of my colleagues out there who are doing the best they can in these incredible circumstances. So thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, and uh, stay tuned, we'll be having some more webinars. Yes, thank you everyone, keep tuned.